Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. My name's Dean. I used to be a ranger of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park located in Northern Carolina. I was guiding a group of Spanish tourists and none of them knew English. Our communication was more than terrible. I left them near a river returning to base. Two hours go by. I returned to see if everybody was fine and if nobody was lost. We went back to a safe place. The afternoon was turning into night and being there would be extremely dangerous. We arrived, and one of the tourists told me that we'd forgotten somebody, a young woman with a notebook. He told me she was trying to collect some data about birds and insects. Immediately, I went to search for her. I took everything I had before going. I told everybody to stay there, and I'd be back in a half hour flat. The forest was dark. The insect noises. I heard her distressed call near the river. I arrived there, and she was being attacked by bats. I grabbed my gun, firing several shots into the air. The bats fled, and the woman had some superficial bite wounds. She panicked and fainted. I waited for her to recover, then took her back to the safe place so I can get her first aid. We were walking. She was having some difficulties, even if I was helping her. The forest was dark and suddenly began to rain. As we walked harder, some hours have passed and we had arrived. The other tourists were waiting for our return and became shocked at what had happened. I gave her first aid. All the tourists asked to get back to the city. I told them that would not be possible in that condition. It was raining a lot, the track was wet, and we would all probably suffer accidents. I told everybody to sleep, and when the morning appeared, the young woman was dead. Her body had more wounds than last night. An old man had some bite wounds on his left arm and did not wake up. His wife had tried to wake him, but when he finally woke, he had a severe heart attack and died. The old woman in tears, the other two tourists tried to calm her down and ask me what happened. After hours of searching, night came, and this time I was completely alone. Five years of working as a ranger of this park gave me the knowledge to be prepared for anything or so I thought. At midnight, I heard a strange noise sounding like a huge airplane or something. I decided to go see what was happening. I arrived and saw something that nobody would believe in my words giant bats, and I'm not talking about regular bats. These were massive, the size of humans, and what's worse, as I saw them in the light, they were human hybrids, part human, part bat, and they were devouring the body of a wolf with hands and claws and a face that looked like a demon. I panicked, running faster than I could. These things saw me, flying off in the sky and taking my direction, almost trying to catch me. The woods were dark, and my light only prevailed through so much darkness. I entered a small cavern that would provide me ample coverage. I guess you can call it a cavern. It was more like a little outing in the wall. But they were flying in the air, looking for me. They looked like large, deformed black dogs, taller than humans, red eyes, and long tails. I shot at one of them, and they came screaming in my direction. I waited for the right moment to run, returning back when I had arrived. I could still hear them flying around in the distance. I told everybody to keep quiet, immediately radioing my boss, telling him we have an issue. He asked that I speak with him in private as it sounded like he kind of already knew what was going on. When I spoke to him, he threw some paperwork in front of me and told me to sign it. It was an NDA. He looked at me and told me, this is not going to be the first time you have to sign these. Better get used to it on this job, which is why I have to be very careful with my identity. At the beginning of this story, I told you my name was Dean. Obviously, I'm sure you've already guessed that's not my real name. It's merely a placeholder. I guess there are several other rangers who have seen these same bats. What they are, I'm not sure. Could they be the elusive bat squatch? Possibly. But they looked far more hideous, and unlike a bat squatch, they were not covered in hair. They were far worse. Unfortunately, not always as it seems in these national parks and many of these things were told to keep quiet about. 
All I can say is for anyone wanting to venture out at night, be very, very careful whether you're in a national park or not. My husband now X and I were hiking cross country in Oregon, mostly following a creek bed that didn't seem to be used much, if at all, by other hikers. When we came around a bend in the creek, we saw something that seemed quite tall. Maybe as tall as a moose, but not a moose. At first I thought it was a bear standing up, but it was moving away from us, going in the same direction as us across a rocky creek meadow that had opened up suddenly and that also had several boulders strewn about. It looked over its shoulder briefly during one of its strides, like a nonchalant or natural action, not a craning of the neck or anything and continued on. It was almost like its head automatically turned slightly in the direction of the back swinging arm. It seemed I could make out arms swinging, but I admit my mind was whirling. It was not a moose. The face was flat, there was no rack or anything animal looking about it. It then turned away from the creek bed and went up the mountainside. Although I got the impression that this was not a last minute, panic decision because of us. Just that it was continuing on its original planned course, very leisurely looking. It mostly went straight up very easily and just barely cutting across the natural slope. Either this thing had been right in front of us for a while, moving along the same creek bed, or we caught it just having come off the mountain or just having started to move off at that point. It seemed more like it had been ahead of us the whole time, which was a creepy feeling. Anyway, I had not been looking for any footprints. I'm a rock hunter and had no belief or interest in Bigfoot at that time. Details of location and terrain are few but I have seen elk, moose, buffalo, and grizzly bear in various other treks. This seemed at first glance, and without much to use for scale, to be much larger than any of those, and appeared to be on two legs taller than it was long or wide. I only got glimpses of it as it went around boulders, trees, etc., and I did not attempt to get closer. We immediately headed back the way we came and spent one uneasy night in the wilderness before getting back to our car, probably about a six-hour hike in. I do know I forced my husband to put as much distance as possible between us and the thing that night. I even forced us to go on in the dark using flashlights as slow going as it was jumping at every cracking tree limb and every rustle of a bush. That's it except for the one other thing I did notice before I turned and scurried away, practically knocking over my husband in my desire to run. I grew up in a house where my backyard was a huge forest in rural Illinois. When I was a kid, I loved being outdoors and would take every possible opportunity to run amok in the woods with my best friend. When we were younger, 11-12, we stayed closer to the house and the outskirts and climbed the trees. As we got older, 1315, we would venture deep, walking and swimming in the rivers and building little forts. When I was 16, the forest was roped off and closed off to the public as a company had began illegally dumping lead or mercury into the woods, but that's another story. It was the middle of a hot summer and I was about 15 at the time. Dusk was approaching and my friend had to go home for dinner, but I wasn't quite ready to leave. We parted ways and I climbed up a tree near my favorite spot over the river. Now these woods backed up to a local gun club, so it wasn't uncommon to hear shooting. However, this gun club was contained in its own private property and the members never ventured out into the forest. I sat in my tree for a little bit and ate the blackberries I'd picked earlier while watching it get darker, when I suddenly spotted movement out of the corner of my eye. At first I assumed it was a younger deer because it was larger but not huge, but I quickly realized it was a man. He seemed to be in his late thirties or early forties, and he wore a black t-shirt and camo pants with creepy, wiry facial hair. He was skulking like he didn't want to be seen. I thought this was odd, but had no intention of making my presence known since something felt wrong, and being a 15-year-old girl alone in the woods, I knew I was at a disadvantage. I slowed my breath down and watched. At first he didn't say anything as he walked around the base of the trees. It was around that time that I realized he had a gun slung over his back. 
Once he got near the river where my friend and I had been loudly goofing off maybe 10 minutes earlier, he started calling out, Hey, anyone here? Help. While grabbing his rifle. When there was no response and no noise, he gave up after a few minutes and began walking downstream. I waited until it was pitch black before sliding out of that tree as quietly as I could, running home and having my parents call the cops. They never found anything. I could never bring myself to go back. My name is Officer T. Williamson, and I'm currently an officer in a small town east of Phoenix, Arizona. My encounter involves an online report that I had read from a man who goes by the name of Ken. The report detailed how he and his family have been being harassed by what they believe to be a demon for almost three years now. Mr. Ken begins the report by describing the very first encounter he had with this evil entity, which occurred back in the fall of 2013 at their home in Arizona. While nobody else was around except for his wife, who at the time was taking a shower, he explains that out of nowhere, he hears her scream from upstairs. So he runs up there to see what's wrong, only to find her standing there frozen with terror written all over her face, staring into the nothingness. When he asked her what was wrong, she described a tall, dark figure standing in the corner of their bedroom right outside of their bathroom door. Mr. Ken claims that when he looked in the same corner, all he saw was a pitch black void where the figure had been standing, which caused this intense feeling of dread to come over him, made him feel as if death were staring him into his very soul. He told his wife there's nothing there, let her out of the bathroom for fear of her safety, after she clearly voiced concern about going back into the room, and with it still being very present, she had a hard time even going back in there, just turning off the shower. Ken then explains how throughout the next three years, this entity would go on to harass the family, manifesting in just about a different form every night. Whether it be the same dark figure or sometimes this evil-looking gnome creature with red eyes, and another time he claims it appeared as a spirit made of pure fire. He said that although nothing ever physically happened to anybody within the house, everyone has experienced scratch marks, cuts, bruising all over their bodies for no real reason at all, all happening at separate times. Ken, too, claims that whatever this thing is, loves to stand outside the bathroom door while people are showering and appears to be immune to things like crosses or crucifixes or even holy water. Going deeper into the report that I read, it didn't go into too much more detail about this entity, but from what Ken did say, it sounded like this was a type of spirit that takes the form it believes will frighten its victim, the most a shape-shifting spirit. That being said, if Ken's family has been dealing with one for almost three years, I would say they have done very well in keeping whatever this thing was harassing them away from harming anybody. I'm not sure why this thing chose to show itself now after all these years, but maybe something happened recently to make it think attacking them might be possible. It also makes me wonder whether or not whoever wrote this report actually recorded everything their demon did throughout all the years and left that stuff out when writing about it, just in case anybody reading it decided to call them out on their story. I don't think what Ken has been experiencing was either a demon or a bogart, but an entity that he and his family unintentionally invoked by possibly playing around with some kind of occult paraphernalia, which caused a ritualistic nightmare spirit to cross over from the spirit realm into their home, which they then failed to send back. If this really did go on for three years straight, I would say whatever is going on with their house definitely falls under the paranormal category instead of something rational like waking up at night and scratching yourself with your eyes still closed because you were dreaming about scratching yourself, when in reality, you're just moving around in your sleep due to maybe a medical condition or maybe even suffering from sleep paralysis. Sometimes you just have to take people who claim they are being harassed by something invisible with a grain of salt. I mean, even if it is real, there might just be some sort of logical explanation of what's going on that they possibly haven't thought of yet. I live in an odd little place in Appalachia that was supposedly carved out of the mountains by a meteor. There is a 360-degree view of mountains around me at all times. 
Well, when I was in middle school, I got really into mountain biking. It was the 90s, don't ask. So, because I was so young, and since my mom didn't want me to be on some random mountain path that didn't have anyone on it for months, she would only let me go on deep trail with the guy who owned the bike shop and was also a co-worker, as she was a teacher. Well, it had been months since I started doing weekly rides with the guy Joe was his name, and a few other guys he had rode with. We went up this place we called Lake Hill, as it was the road to the city's water supply, which was a lake-sized natural spring. We'd been riding for hours. I mean, like daybreak to probably an hour before dark. We just got to the point where we were going to turn around when we crest this hill and bam. There stands a dude. Wearing camo gear, a yellow raincoat in the middle of summer, standing about 15 feet away from a four-wheeler, with a shotgun in his hand. Joe, who was the most athletic of us, was in front, I think I had gotten behind him, and there were two other guys behind me. When you're pedaling a mountain bike up a steepish hill, you're not looking forward. You're looking down, or at least at the ground. You're studying where your wheel is going so you don't run over anything that might ruin your momentum. So when I ran into the back of Joe, I was kind of pissed. I looked up sharply and saw Joe, positioning himself between me and the dude. The man said nothing. Not one single word. Not a word of comfort or compassion for the fact we just ran up on him with a shotgun. This is the South. People are hospitable. You don't see two strangers in a deserted place not say hello to one another. I swear it might be the fact I've played this event over in my head dozens of times and want to read in it what I think was happening. Or this is really what happened. Guy. These mother F have just found me harvesting my pot. What if they tell the cops? Can I afford to take that chance? I don't know, there are a few of them. Shit, that one's a kid. Because I could see an edge of tension bleed out of his face when he looked at me. I swear it was him deciding to kill Joe, then deciding not to kill me. Joe, to his credit, positioned himself between the man and me the whole time. Eventually, the dude hopped on his four-wheeler, covered in plants, and rode away. I never will forget that taste of exhaustion and adrenaline as we came off that hill. Luckily in mountain bike riding the ups are the hard part. We were doing the fastest speed I still have ever done on a bike, while in the mountains. I'm actually feeling cold and nervous talking about this. I live in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania in Delaware County. I went to college in Philadelphia. My parents moved to Florida a few months ago, but they kept their house here, so I'm living in it right now. The property is along the bank of the Delaware River. The river is 20 or so yards from the back door of the house. I had found a new job and I stayed up later and later. I was bored and with nobody else to hang out with. Most nights I would wind up outside in a lawn chair, fishing in the river until 3 in the morning. It was on a night like this when the first incident happened. I wasn't paying too much attention around me. I was watching something on my phone and my rod started bouncing around like crazy. I jumped up to set the hook jerking it back. The line went slack for a second and then jerked away. I figured I had a fish on, but when I tried to reel again it wouldn't budge. I thought maybe I was snagged, but then the line snapped away again. I'm not an expert fisherman, but the way the line moved was odd, not like a typical fish bite, but like something in the water was purposely pulling back on the line each time I did. It was almost like it was intelligent. I was a bit freaked out and I ended up just cutting the line and heading back inside. I told myself it was caught on a snag or something, but I suspected otherwise. A week later I had fallen asleep in my chair, and I woke up startled after hearing a large splash in the water just a few yards out. The light from my back porch barely hit the edge of the water, and I could see a series of rings spreading out from where something had entered the water. A new set of rings then appeared a few feet away, and then again and again until they were out of sight. I was a bit baffled since catfish or bottom feeders seldom come to the surface of the water, and they rarely jump. I grabbed my gear and headed inside, but in my groggy state, I left my cutting board knife and a fresh bag of bait. I used pepperoni for catfish sitting on the ground outside. 
The next day I realized what I had done and I went outside to retrieve it. Everything was gone. In the patch of dirt near where I had left the stuff I could see faint prints. Some kind of thin-footed animal with only two long slender toes had been walking through the area. I also found silvery fish scales that were spread sporadically around and both prints and the scales led straight back to the water's edge. I must admit that at this point I was a little bugged out. I didn't know what to make of the evidence, but I figured that any kind of call to the police was going to get me laughed at. I tried to find information on the prints online, but with no luck. I decided that I would give fishing a rest for a while. I needed to get better sleep anyway. I was starting to get tired halfway through the day at work. Two weeks went by and I hadn't been back outside to fish. I had started dating a new girl. Between her and work I pretty much forgot all about the tracks. But then the most bizarre incident occurred. I was fast asleep in the room upstairs when I was shaken awake by my girlfriend. She told me that my dog was downstairs barking like crazy. I'm a heavy sleeper and probably wouldn't have noticed, but sure enough he was downstairs going nuts. Before I reached the stairs the barking abruptly stopped, but then it turned into a low growl. I felt a twinge of panic. My girlfriend was behind me on the stairs and we crept down quietly. I could see the dog standing at the back door in a rigid posture growling at something outside. I walked quietly over to him and tried to calm him down. I was stroking his head when I heard my girlfriend let out a gasp. She was looking through the small window of the back door. I stood up to look for myself. Unmistakably, there were two bipedal creatures, no more than three feet tall, walking around my backyard. It was dark and the lights were off, but I could make out a pallid silver color to them. They had no eyes that I could see, but something like a fin was running along the spine of each creature. We stood frozen for a few moments watching these two creatures. At one point they ambled over to each other. I swear that they were making hand gestures toward the house. My girlfriend saw this too and whispered that she was going to call the cops. She ran upstairs to grab her phone while I stayed and watched for a few more minutes. My dog started barking again, and this time both creatures just walked away towards the river and disappeared under the water. The police arrived about 20 minutes later and looked around. They didn't see any sign of the creatures, but said that they had found some wet prints outside. They were the exact same ones that I had seen on the ground a few weeks ago. Since no crime was committed, they didn't seem too interested. But the officers took my report and told me to call again if anything else happened. So this was a month ago. I've looked online for any kind of information on these creatures, but I can't find anything. I haven't gotten a good night's sleep since and my girlfriend has refused to come back to the house. Do you have any idea what these creatures may have been? My event took place on 2021 at 18 in Denver, Colorado. In the two half years following my event, I have had a host of very strange phenomena happen to me. I have been shy about talking about these things, from what I believe is a result of my interaction with this object. The event started with me witnessing a bright yellow cylinder craft hovering above Interstate 70 just east of Denver. At the time I felt a sudden fear, but that feeling quickly changed to euphoria. I don't remember much after that, other than waking in my bed the next morning. About two months after my encounter sighting all of the moles on my body began to fade and then completely disappear. To date, five moles have completely disappeared and nine more are in different states of fading. About five months after this event occurred all of the hair on my arms and legs began to change to light blonde in mass. I have medium brown hair and am only 31 years old. Although I originally considered premature graying, I began to notice the individual hairs changed color from the root upwards. And when the hair started to change, it took about five days for the complete hair change. The top of the hair fading from medium brown to reddish to blonde. So it was not as if it was growing out this color, and no amount of sun exposure has ever caused lightning like this on me before. Also, the hairs that have changed colors have actually changed in consistency. They were originally a medium coarseness, and now they are feather-soft fine. 
About two months ago, the spider veins in my legs began to fade, and now one that I have had for about seven years is completely gone, and another is fading rapidly. Since this has occurred, I have had dreams almost nightly of entities who talk to me and claim to be intelligent species from somewhere else, and they keep trying to give me strange information I don't understand. I woke up a few times and caught myself uttering some language that I have never heard before. But I have ruled out speaking in tongues because it seems this language seems to have structure and form. I also have feelings of hot and cold in different parts of my body. I get pulsating feelings on the bottom of my feet up my legs down my arms and on the palms of my hands. Sometimes this pulsating becomes so intense it is painful. I have also felt this heat pulsating feeling right below my eyes, between my eyes, and in the front of my brain. I am very upset and confused as to what is going on with me. I live on the back of the ranch where I work. I got the job in college and I've graduated since, but working the olive orchard or vineyard since has been pretty gratifying. My first year living on site, third year working there, I got really drunk and drove the utility vehicle I'm responsible for out into the enchanted forest. This is the place the cows run off to when a bad rainstorm comes through. The ranch hand before me took off immediately when my boss told him to move out so I could take over, and when I did so there were 15 head of cattle. I was on top of this number and counted them each and every day I fed them. Some calves had come in, so the number had jumped up. But the point was that if something happened to a particular cow, I would notice by the end of the day and could search for her or him, if it was a bull. Anyways, I'm toasted and enjoying revving this Kawasaki mule up and down the different hilly sections of the far end of the ranch by starlight, when a shit ton of vultures burst into the air in front of me. I screech to a halt as a horrible smell fills the air, and find myself staring into the maggoty eyes of a recently dead cow. She's still got flesh, so she hasn't been dead long, but I don't recognize her from the small herd I deal with every day. There's a thick scent of death and something else in the air. I leave the headlights on the mule running and circle around her with my LED flashlight and see a huge, sickly flesh balloon dropped out from between her hind legs. Working on a ranch, you get used to death because it's a huge part of the whole thing. But the strange smell behind the familiar scent was this pouch coming out of her containing her stillborn fetus. As best I can figure, she had died attempting to give birth after the herd had rejected her following her isolation from them during some kind of sickness under the previous ranch hand's term. Something he had never mentioned to me or my boss. The smell was worse the next day when I used a forklift to carry or drag her into a shallow grave in order to dump lime all over her. But stumbling across her while chasing a stargazing spot is forever etched into my mind. During the summer of 1989, my girlfriend and I decided to take a few days and go visit my mother and family in Spokane, Washington. We lived in Southern California and I have driven north to visit her a few times. I usually stick to the main interstates for fear of running out of gas. Anyway, on this particular drive, I decided to take a shortcut through Oregon to try and save some time. I saw on the map that Highway 97 would be a good route to take. I knew that Bend was a fairly good sized town with services if I needed them. The night was beautiful with a little moonlight, so I opened up the moonroof on the car so I could peek up at it from time to time. The road had tall timbers on both sides and it was pitch black beyond them. My girlfriend was asleep at the time. The road took a slow curve to the right. I was probably driving around 50, 55 miles per hour when suddenly to my right, my headlights lit up a huge hairy creature. It was walking upright on two legs and heading the same direction I was traveling so I couldn't see a face. I could make out its height of about seven, eight feet. I had to look up out of the windshield at it. It had reddish, dirty brown hair, broad shoulders, and a short neck with a rounded head. I quickly put my foot on the brake, hoping my tail lights would give my a view from my rear view mirror, but it didn't work. I took the next turnout, which was a few hundred feet down the road. 
I woke up my girlfriend and told her what I saw. At first she thought I was kidding around until I turned the car around and went back to see if it was still there. No luck, it must have got spooked and made off into the woods. I'm an avid hunter and outdoorsman. I know what bears and elk and moose look like, and this was neither. I know what I saw, and it was him. I will never forget that night. When I tell my friends of the story, they believe me, because I'm a very trustworthy guy and I don't make up stories for the hell of it. I lived in a rural area, though it was fairly close 25 miles to the nearest city and maybe 10 miles to the nearest town. One day I was riding the bus to school and saw an odd collection of trash, a mannequin, shopping cart, and tarp hanging from a tree in the woods to the side of the road. A few days later I noticed it was gone and figured somebody had cleaned it up. Things got weird when it reappeared on a different road after a week or two. This happened a few times over the course of a couple months, and I didn't tell anyone because it sounded a bit crazy. Really late one night, I was watching TV and my neighbor's dog started barking. This isn't unusual, but the nights are extremely quiet, and I heard an odd rattling that eventually sounded like a shopping cart. I turned off the TV, hid under the blankets, and watched a disheveled person push a shopping cart with a mannequin in it past my house. This was during the middle of winter. It's bitterly cold, the wind is deadly, and feet of snow are fairly common. There was zero chance anyone would believe me, so I never said anything. Fast forward several years later, and I was home from college for the summer. My mom is an adult protective worker and tells me about a referral she got involving a schizophrenic homeless guy who pushes a mannequin his wife, apparently around in a shopping cart. This was in the city, but she then tells me he for some reason walked all the way to my area and lived in the woods for an entire winter eating roadkill and God knows what else. My old man served in the Royal Navy and Merchant Navy. He told me about these access spaces that ran through the ship. One ran the full length of the bulk carrier he was on in a storm and some poor sod had to do down there to do something. They opened it up, and there's lights all along it. As the ship flexed in the storm, they could see the lights at the end disappear and reappear. Wasn't exactly a rush of volunteers to go down there. He always said that St. Elmo's fire could be quite eerie when you saw it on another ship. Worst he ever told me about was when they got a mayday call from another ship that was on fire. They were the nearest and responded, but were a good 48 HRS away. The radios died before they got there. No one survived. Me, my father, and uncle were out one evening hunting during the early archery season. This is southern Indiana, so you can certainly get in areas very far away from other human beings. But this is not like being in remote Montana or something. We, we had hiked pretty far back into a big valley. People imaging Indiana as flat, but that is northern part. Southern Indiana is very hilly and rocky. We saw nothing and began to head back. At this point it was dark and we were about halfway up the valley. Once we got to the top it was a much easier walk that eventually connected to a fire trail. I want to repeat I am sure there is a very rational, boring explanation to this. Well we are walking and all of a sudden there was this. Noise behind us. I can't explain it. If you talk to people who spend a lot of time in the outdoors, they can all tell you weird sounds you hear. I mean, it happens. What made this one so weird is it was unlike anything we have ever heard. It was loud. Very loud. The best we can describe it as was a horrible screech with the mix of a growl. I can still hear that noise in my head today. It was genuinely terrifying, and in the woods in early archery season can be very noisy, but when this screech or growl happened it got quiet. Maybe that was just our brains focusing on the unusual noise and ignoring the standard forest background noise, but we all remember this noise and how it echoed through the woods, and it sounds so unnatural it sounded. It sounded angry. It seems like I'm rambling, but I just can't tell you how terrifying this noise was. 
Nothing in any horror film or sound effect has come close to replicating that sound. There are no words to give it justice. This is when shit really hits the fan. The second this noise happened, we all of course froze. I was young, but still had spent quite a bit of time in the wood. But my father and uncle have spent a lot of time in the woods, and it was very dark and my uncle was just barely visible in front of my and my father and our headlamps glow. But I remember we all froze in fear, and he turned back to my father Mimi and asked, what was? And in the process of him saying that we were all three turning around back towards the noise, you have to remember this all happened very quickly. In reality, from the time this awful noise happened, and we turned around, it had been maybe five seconds. But as we all collectively turned around, there was this bright flash of light. I know how insane that sounds, and to this day when we tell this story, people usually start to smile or laugh. But I am as serious as a heart attack. As we turned around, there was this sudden flash of light in the treetops. It was bright and covered a very wide area. It lasted a second or two, and it went pitch black again. It was just like the cliché. All three of us with zero words began to run. There was not yelling, no pause, nothing. We all three just ran as fast as we could. My father even started pulling at me up this steep incline, but none of us spoke a thing until we got back to our vehicles. Now I do not believe it was a UFO. Should I honestly do not believe in UFOs at all? There is no road in that direction, but we like to think that maybe the conditions were just right and some large vehicle on a road nearby had their lights hit the treetops, or maybe it was like somebody with a flare or some shit. But we have all been in the woods and seen cars drive by, many with their blinders on to watch for deer, and this light was not like this. It was sudden, bright, white, and was in the treetops. I mean, as batshit as this sounds, it was like those cheesy UFO movies where the alien ship hovers and shines a big light from above. I am not saying that is what it is, but that is the best way to describe it. We have honestly spent over 10 years running through scenarios, and even though my brain tells me, dude, this shit happens, do not fall for this. It was just an unusual set of circumstances, and in the darkness your brain put the pieces together the best it could. There was no creature or UFO, but it is hard sometimes when you replay that event in your head. If it had maybe been the noise or the light alone, I think we would blow it off, but it all happened together, and that is what really sticks with us all. I'm going to be that old guy telling this story with the young people mocking me and I can't blame them. I would too, but that does not change what happened and what I experienced. I'll start out by saying that the small town where I grew up, and where all of my family still resides, is in Monroe County, Ohio maybe 20 minutes or so outside of Wheeling, West Virginia. I was talking to my dad on the phone the other night. He told me that last week while driving home from work, he came across something he can't explain. His voice was shaky, unlike I have ever heard him. He works the night shift at a local coal mine and while driving home from work early one morning around 5.30 a.m., he noticed a large creature crouched down in the road. It had bright red glowing eyes that looked directly at him. He said this creature also had very large wings which were wrapped around it as it crouched. He said he had never in his life seen anything like this. It had really upset him. He proceeded to drive by it, but when he looked behind him, it was gone. He said that he was actually scared to get out of his car when he got home in fear that perhaps it had followed him, or was even in his car. After a few very tense minutes, he slowly got out of the car. There was nothing there. I asked him if he had ever heard of the Mothman. He kind of paused, then said that he had never heard of it until he started talking to people about what he had seen. He said that they would say right away, It sounds like you saw the Mothman. You hear weird stories all the time, and because you don't really know the person who witnessed it, you just shrug it off. Knowing my dad and what a logical thinker he is, I believe he encountered something supernatural. He is usually the one who tries to come up with logical answers for things that are otherwise unexplained. He's very skeptical when it comes to aliens, UFOs, ghosts, etc. 
For me to talk to him and hear him tell me about this Mothman-like creature was shocking. For this is not like my father. I will say that I am concerned. For what I understand is that when a person actually witnesses a Mothman, oftentimes bad things happen afterward. There isn't a doubt in my mind that what he saw was 100% true. It has completely made a believer out of me when it comes to the Mothman. I hope for the sake of my father and my family that that isn't true and that he made a mistake of identity. Hey everyone. So just to kick off, I am normally super skeptical of anything paranormal and I don't believe in ghosts, but I moved into an apartment 10 months ago and strange things won't stop happening. To start with, I went out of my way to find earthly if that's the right term explanations, but I am at the end of my wit and thought that maybe I would post my experiences here and people might help me understand what's happening. So a bit of background. I moved to Lisbon, Portugal last year and I found an apartment in an old building. I think it was built in 1890. I live by myself and I have never had a supernatural experience before this. All these events happened over the course of the 10 month period. But I think if I just bullet point everything that happened in chronological order, it's probably the most simple. I was in the bathroom and I hear a bang in the kitchen. I go out and see that my bananas that were on the kitchen shelf had fallen onto the floor. I hadn't touched anything in the kitchen for a couple of hours, but I figured they may have just been unbalanced and fallen. I am working at my desk in the living room and the mug in front of me starts moving by itself and then even changes direction and starts moving towards me. My reaction was actually like, this is cool, what's happening? I initially thought that it was to do with a condensation trail from the mug, but when I picked up the mug it's bone dry, like I had had a cup of tea the day before and not cleaned it up yet. I tried banging the desk, but I couldn't get the mug to move at all. I woke up and saw a girl at the end of my bed. A girl I was dating was staying over that night, so I assumed it was her, and that she had woken up. I asked, Are you alright? And she didn't reply. I repeated the question and still no reply, so I reached over to tap her on the shoulder, and when I started to lean across I realized the girl I was dating was still asleep next to me. A hit of adrenaline suddenly filled my body and went from being half asleep to wide awake. I was thinking, if she is here, who is at the end of my bed? Even at that moment, I was thinking I must have dreamt it, but I looked up and the girl was still there at the end of the bed. I stared in disbelief and her figure just slowly faded away. I was left stunned. I knew I had been awake the whole time because I had taken my retainer out to speak and it was still in my hands. I had started feeling uneasy ever since seeing the girl and at 2 a.m. in the morning I heard a bang in the kitchen. I had to really build myself up to go out there and I had convinced myself I had probably heard something from another apartment. But when I went into the kitchen, a load of cans from the middle shelf, the same one as the bananas were on the floor and everything on the shelf had been knocked over like someone had swiped it with their arm. At this point, I started telling people about these things at this point, which is kind of a weird feeling as an unbeliever. I tried to make an explanation for everything that had happened but I couldn't really come up with a convincing story. I realized that a few things had gone missing from my apartment, like a few items of clothes and a small ball I used to help to stretch my foot. I look everywhere in my apartment, which is really small, but I never find anything. I also found a human scab on the floor. Super disgusting, I know. I had no scabs on my body at this point, and my only explanation is that maybe it stuck to the bottom of my shoe and I brought it into my apartment. I also find hairs on the floor that do not belong to me. I hardly have any visitors, so again, this is quite a confusing thing to find. Everything then kind of settled down for a bit, and then last night and I had another thing happen. 5. This morning, my jogging bottoms, I think you would call them sweatpants in the States, were on the floor and were soaking wet. At first, I didn't find this really weird, but then I started thinking about it, how did this happen? I was wearing them yesterday, so they were definitely dry during the day, and nothing else in the apartment was wet. 
No leak from the roof, the floor around them was dry, and there were no drip marks. I even checked the sinks in the shower, and they were completely dry. Even the non-paranormal explanations I could think of made me feel uneasy. I realized my door wasn't properly locked last night. Could someone have come into my apartment, wet my pants, and then left? I am sleepwalking. The jogging bottoms smelled just of water, but they were completely soaked like they had been submerged in water. I just can't think how it could have happened. I am actually moving out of my apartment really soon, but this whole experience has left me creeped out. Maybe there is a logical explanation for everything, but I am struggling. What are your thoughts? What should I do? My friend and I both 18-year-old males at the time decided to go camping in the Mogollon Rim of northern Arizona. We had no particular spot in mind as to where to camp, so we drove around the NF woods until we came across a small, very secluded lake. I literally brought everything a guy would need to be out camping in the wilderness. Sleeping bags, lighter, food, knife, etc. Except I had forgotten my brand new Coleman tent I purchased specifically for this adventure. So we wound up just camping in our sleeping bags on the ground next to the fire. It took forever to fall asleep because the temperatures dropped below freezing and we were shaking. We went based off the weather for Payson, Arizona, which was 4,000 feet and 50 miles from where we actually laid camp. My friend will call in Tom fell asleep before I did. I can't remember if ever did fall asleep or if I was just half asleep. But around midnight, I start hearing some really weird noises in the distance. I knew their elk buggling nearby, so I didn't think much of it. Gradually, a snapping sound kept getting closer and closer to the camp over the course of about a half hour. I started getting scared, hoping it would go away, but it didn't. Suddenly, on the side of camp closest to Tom, I hear something running through the meadow straight toward us. I jumped up so fast and yelled at Tom to get up. While I was yelling at him, I was searching the ground nearby for my .40 caliber handgun. By the time I got the gun and flashlight trained on Tom, there is was massive black bear standing right above him. Tom was trying to get up having realized there was in fact a bear hovering above him. I aimed in the direction of the bear and squeezed the trigger four times. I could hear the bear run off not knowing whether I hit it or not. We were shaking so fiercely afterwards I couldn't tell if it was the cold or the adrenaline. We then packed our sleeping bags and left all of the other stuff to retrieve in the morning and began the half-mile walk back to the dirt road where Tom's car was. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Bear stalked us all the way back to the car. When I was a kid, I went for cross-country biking nearby to our home. There is a roughly two kilometers, one, five miles loop of a forest path in the forest. It is ride-able if a bit difficult at some points. After just riding a couple of minutes on a narrow forest path, I see a figure walking ahead of me. It looks like a hooded elderly lady walking really slowly. I cannot see her face or anything, just a dark hood covering her. I recall she being very tall, but I was also just 13 years old, so she could have been normal size. I drove just behind her, but the path is too narrow to overtake her from any of her sides. Also, I get this heavy feeling on my chest telling me not to try to overtake her. I can't explain it, but something just felt very off when I got closer to her. I stop my bike and get off and watch her walk ahead of me. I then think that this is silly, and she must be startled if she turns around and sees me there. So I think to act cool and turn down to pick up a blueberry. I pick it up, raise my head back to the road ahead of me, and there is nothing. I can see the path ahead maybe 50 meters, and it's just impossible that she would have never done that distance within those five seconds I wasn't watching. I then try to reason this with and think that she must have jumped off road, since there is extremely thick bushes and I cannot see there. I felt a bit uneasy about this, but decide to continue. I ride my bike about 500 meters more, and there is a cliff where I can see down the road ahead another 500 meters. And there she is, I can see her walking there again really slowly. 
Again, tall figure covered in a dark hood. I cannot see her face or anything but the hood she is wearing. And she is walking slowly on the road. I really couldn't figure out how she made it there in such a short time, since even I couldn't do the distance in that time even with my bike. I am extremely alarmed at this point, but decide to continue. I drive the hill down and to the spot where I saw her before. Again, there is nothing. At this part of the forest, it is more open, and I can see quite far in any direction. Yet she is nowhere to be seen, and yet there she was just 30 seconds before. I continue my trip and finally finish my first loop of the trail, and decide to go yet another round. After going for a couple of minutes, there she is, exactly the same spot I saw her at the first time, again tall dark hooded, walking slowly. I got totally freaked out after this, I rode off the woods as fast as I could, and in a total panic ride to my friend's home which was further away from the woods than my own home. Until today I have no idea what I saw, and it gives me the chills when I remember her figure. The moon hung low in the night sky as I stood outside the apartment building, my heart pounding with a mix of excitement and nervous anticipation. Today was the day I would join the ranks of the police force as a rookie officer. My name is Alex, and I had always dreamed of making a difference, of upholding justice in a world that seemed too often plagued by darkness. My partner for this first assignment was Detective Ryan, a seasoned veteran with a reputation for his sharp instincts and unwavering resolve. Together, we were tasked with investigating a homicide case, a daunting task for a rookie like me, but I was eager to prove myself. As we approached the apartment, a sense of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. The door was locked, a barrier between us and the truth hidden within. With a swift kick, Detective Ryan forced the door open, revealing a chilling scene that would forever be etched in my memory. There before us lay the lifeless body of the victim. It was a gruesome sight, a chilling reminder of the evil that lurked in the shadows. But what shocked us both was not just the presence of death, but the grotesque creature feasting on the remains. It was a dog-like creature, but larger, more akin to a wolf. Its hulking figure loomed over the body, its snarling face contorted with an unsettling mix of animalistic hunger and a twisted, human-like visage. The sight sent shivers down my spine, and I felt an instinctive urge to protect and serve, to rid the world of this abomination. Reacting on pure instinct, Detective Ryan and I drew our weapons and fired at the creature, hoping to neutralize the threat it posed. But the bullets seemed to have little effect. It let out a chilling growl, launching itself at us with a speed and strength that defied logic. Caught off guard, we were tackled to the ground, our bodies hitting the floor with a resounding thud. The creature slipped away from our grasp, a blur of fur and teeth, disappearing into the night before we could regain our footing. The chaos and confusion that ensued left us breathless, questioning the reality of what we had just witnessed. We exchanged bewildered glances, our faces etched with disbelief and uncertainty. Did we really see what we think we saw, or was it some hallucination brought on by exhaustion or something we inadvertently ingested? The questions lingered in the air, a heavy fog obscuring the truth. With a deep breath, Detective Ryan and I collected ourselves, determined to make sense of the inexplicable. We scoured the surroundings, searching for any trace of the creature, but it was as if it had vanished into thin air. Frustration mingled with disbelief, our minds struggling to comprehend the events that had unfolded. As we stood there, gazing into each other's eyes, a silent understanding passed between us. We may never fully understand what we witnessed that night, but we knew that our duty remained to protect the innocent, to uphold justice, and to face the darkness head-on, even when it defied explanation. In the end, we may never have a definitive answer to the question that haunted us. Did we truly encounter a monstrous being, or was it an illusion, a trick of the mind? I'm from California, and I was in the northeastern corner of North Carolina the day before Thanksgiving visiting a friend. While visiting, I set out for a casual stroll to take in some of this beautiful country. 
There was an old church with a huge cemetery behind it featuring graves from the 1800s and beyond. I took the road north and walked down to an old wooden bridge that crossed the creek that snaked alongside the road. I thought the bridge would be private because the dirt lane on the other side led down to someone's house. But then I noticed a fire road to the left that corkscrewed up the side of the densely wooded hillside that was my route. It was steep, but the air was cool and it felt good to get some exercise. I was about halfway up and I noticed an old car salvage yard in the open meadow below me, right across the road from the old church. About 30 paces later, I got a strange feeling that let me know that I was being watched. So I took two more steps up the hill and heard something sprinting across the top of that hill away from my location. But it was not the general prance like that of a deer. Rather, these steps were deliberate, heavy and lightning fast. Then there was a sound of the breaking of a large branch or a small tree. It then got deathly quiet for a few moments. I cautiously took two more steps. Then I heard faint calculated steps around the crest of the hilltop back in my direction. That strange feeling returned with a vengeance. I froze in my tracks. I was carrying a sidearm. I could hear my heartbeat in the silence. I scanned the topography of the hilltop staring from where I heard the tree break from left to my right, high and low searching for the slightest of movement. I was a sitting duck. I just had my back to whatever had the drop on me. Then I saw it. Just the upper half of a head that was the same color as the two pines it was hiding behind. The rest of the body was concealed by the large underbrush in front. It was as still as those two pine trees. The top of the head was rounded and the eyes were black as coal. The eye size was that of a 50 cent piece and about five inches apart. I don't know how long I stared at this thing, but I do remember thinking what the hell am I looking at? Then it hit me. That has got to be a Bigfoot. Well, that's enough for me, I thought, and back down the hill I went. I heard a minor disturbance in the leaves and it was all over. I have no doubt in my mind that if that Bigfoot wanted me, he certainly could have had me. Fortunately for me, he or she was just curious. The strangest thing about this encounter is that I had no recollection of this event until several years later. My memory shook loose by reading someone else's encounter. I feel incredulous by this fact and can only resolve it as a repressed memory brought on by a traumatic event. I have read hundreds of encounters and listened to lots of testimonies as well, and feel fortunate that I was able to eventually recall the encounter. Folks, I know this might be hard to believe, but it's what I've gone through. I had just finished up with a traffic stop one night where all I found was an expired registration on a car, which did not match the plates. So I let them off without warning, went back to my cruiser to call dispatch before returning to patrol. This being said, I should have been able to see everything in front of me as clear as day, even though it was winter time and where all the trees had lost their leaves, so visibility shouldn't have been too much of an issue. My headlights illuminated almost anything within 100 yards or so, but sometimes things can hide in the shadows of those yards. I noticed something out of my peripheral vision. This is right as I was on the phone with dispatch, so I immediately cut off dispatch and began slowly driving towards where I saw whatever it was, thinking it was a person up to no good. But then I saw that it moved slowly and had a long fluid stride. Despite having no leaves, it seemed to blend in with the surroundings enough that you could just barely make out what it looked like when I saw a large head, two long ears and horns dark deep eye sockets that appeared almost hollow, taken up by most of my headlights illumination. By this point, I felt like Alice chasing after whatever Alice chased after into Wonderland, except without all the trippiness and trying to find an exit. Except this time, it was the one chasing after me. I sped up a bit and tried to keep it in sight, but as I got closer, it suddenly crouched down and I lost sight of it. The more I go into detail about this experience, the deeper things get. Just know that there is no car for it to have gotten into or jump over any fence. So where did it go, whatever it was? But as soon as you stop asking questions is when they get answered. So I slowly circled around the same 100 yards again, 
searching for anything unusual with my high beams on, on full illumination. It must have been hiding from me somehow. There was nothing except a few stray cats starting behind some trash cans on the other side of the street. I jumped some bushes and parked cars, still nothing. So I start to just go back on duty, probably looking like a crazy officer driving around aimlessly for no reason. But that's what we do sometimes in this job. You just never know when something is going to pop out, so better be safe than sorry. I'm about halfway down the block towards my car when suddenly, up ahead of me, which is now being obstructed by tall grass, I see it again. It had been crouched down again, but its head was now tilted upward at an angle directly towards me, and its mouth was wide open. There were no teeth visible that I could recall, and it did not appear to be making any sounds. It would only remain in that position for a few seconds, then it would slowly move from side to side before standing back up on its two legs. It was at least ten yards away from me, so I did the sensible thing, which was to get back into my car, lock the doors. But it just stood there, looking at me for a few seconds, until going back behind some other parked cars, trying to keep out of sight. I don't know what it wanted with me, but if you have watched any cop show or horror movie ever, you probably could have guessed what happened next. I got out of my vehicle, drew my firearm. I'm smart enough to realize that shooting them never works anyway, but as I was about to approach the spot where it had been standing, it suddenly appeared in front of me, stopped and stared at me. And dang it, this thing was fast. It did not make any noise, but its wide open gaping mouth, which now I can see contained what looked like rows of jagged teeth glistening with drool. Then it runs away from me again. I followed right behind it. At this point, I just really wanted to know what this thing was. So forget being scared. I probably should have just gone back into my car for that hour or two remaining of my shift. But there's a reason why they call that being stupid anyway. So I'm chasing after whatever it was, and I'm running pretty fast, but not jumping over anything. This thing was fast, like Usain Bolt fast. It did not even run in a straight line. When it ran away from me, it would just kind of weave in and out of any obstacle in front of it, which consistently mostly apart cars or trash at the time. But when you move so much while trying to evade capture, eventually you're going to fall down. Your legs can only take you so far before they get tired. That's what I think happened in this thing. It seemed to collapse on something that was invisible in my headlights, and then pulls itself back up which I'm not sure if it tripped or why it collapsed. Maybe it was feigning death. I don't know. But as soon as it pulled itself back up, it runs into a nearby backyard, which made sense. I mean, all the streets have been blocked off at this point. So I'm going chasing after it to the same gate that is still wide open in the fence. And to my horror, I see another similar creature on my left, staring right at me like an idiot while not making any noise. It, too, was crouched down like something out of a prehistoric paleo zoo exhibit. Its mouth agape, but I couldn't see any teeth. I couldn't help but notice that this one had very large eyes, much larger than the other one, almost like a child or a baby compared to an adult. And then another creature just took off running while I was still trying to figure out if this creature was real or not, or was I simply running after a nightmare. And then a smaller one jumps right in front of me. Out of reaction, I shoot this one point blank in the chest several times, which my gun did not even seem to phase it. It kept on running towards me, and I panicked at this point. Despite my training, I'm now thinking that this is some kind of demon. I did not even bother shooting at it again. The first few shots seemed to have no effect. So instead of wasting bullets, I pulled out my taser and tased whatever it was, expecting it to fall over but it did not even react. The taser did nothing. Unsure of what to do at this point, I do the only thing I know I can do, run. This creature and the other two gave chase, following quickly behind each other. I made it back to my cruiser and flew out of there. And since this night, I have never seen or dealt with such a creature. But I believe that this was something that had come from deep in the pits of hell. And I know these things are very real.
I've thought about this incident nearly every day for the past 20 years and still don't know exactly what happened. I believe I experienced a rip in the space-time continuum or some other less cliché version of that. All I know is that one moment the sky was blue and the next second it was night. We were staying at my grandmother's house in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania during the summer. When I was a kid, I loved going to my grandma's because it was so different from my life in Philadelphia. So we'd been there for over a week at this point. I just needed to get out of the house. There was a small creek that divided the woods from the property, and there was a thick tree branch that stretched across the brook, so I could use that to hop over the water, and then also use some big rocks as additional stepping stones. I got over the stream and into the woods. I just meandered about. Many years previous, my brother and I had built a tree house, so I decided I would go and try to find it to see if it was still standing. I walked about five minutes into the woods and reached the large oak that once held our makeshift tree house. Not surprisingly, it was a total wreck, and I decided that I'd be foolish to climb up there. So instead, I just started to turn around and walk back to the house. When I reached the creek, this time there was this faint white glow coming from the water. I thought it was weird looking back on it, but just figured that it was probably the angle of the sun or something. I mean the water looked normal except for the edges and the ripples almost shined and sparkled in the light. It's sort of hard to explain. Also, the stream was moving more quickly than usual, but not flooding or anything, so I had no clue why something like this would be happening. I just started to hop my way over the rocks and onto the branch bridge. But when my foot touched the far bank, I felt a flash of light overtake my vision, and I fell flat on the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I thought I'd gone blind. I honestly wondered if I had hurt my eyes somehow. The world had fallen into complete darkness, even though it couldn't have been even half past two in the afternoon. I managed to get myself back on my feet and made my way back to the house. Luckily, I knew the property well, and I made it there without incident. I flung open the door and there stood my mother and my grandmother in the kitchen. The looks on their faces were frightening. I'd never seen them with such serious expressions. My grandmother was on the phone with the police and my brother was sitting quietly on the couch. His head spun as soon as I opened the door I could tell by looking at everybody's faces that they had all been crying. Their cheeks were streaked and their eyes were red. My mom then asked me where I had been and said I knew I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Apparently, I'd been gone for hours. I watched as her face moved between anger and being relieved to see me alive. I couldn't understand it at first because I'd only just walked five minutes into the woods. But they said they had searched and called my name and went down to the creek. But they never saw any signs of me. Nothing. I still don't know what happened, but I do believe that I somehow was caught in a time warp. There's no other explanation that's reasonable for what happened except for something supernatural. I couldn't have fallen or gotten lost because my family searched the area. They would have seen me. I didn't go far. They would have literally had to step over my body if they were in the area of that creek. It's just impossible that I was near where they were looking, and not in some otherworldly place. Still, none of them believed me and my mom was always very adamant that I do not share my story with teachers and friends. Since then, I realized that I wasn't alone in this experience after watching various videos and reading other accounts. But I'm still looking for answers. I can't easily go back there to check it out because my grandmother ended up passing away a few years ago, and after that my family sold the property. I am eventually going to contact them and see if I can go back and find answers. When I was a little kid, my mom was out of town and I was with my dad at our house. Our house was on a remote Indian reserve in Canada, and about three miles away was my grandparents' house. Our houses were separated by three large wheat fields surrounded by forest. I don't know why but my dad got me ready at night time and we started walking on the gravel road to my grandparents' house. My mom had the vehicle with her. I was under the age of five and pretty small girl. I remember it was a clear autumn night. The wheat fields were a few weeks from being harvested 
and there was a bright full moon. There wasn't a single vehicle running in miles. We started hearing something following us. It was in the ditch in the tall grass and in the wheat field. My dad held my hand as he grabbed some stones off the gravel road. He started hurling rocks into the ditch. It would run off and then start following us again. He grabbed more stones and put them in his pocket, then put me on his shoulders. I remember holding onto his forehead when I was sitting on his shoulders and it was all sweaty. I wasn't scared. I was getting excited every time I spotted that thing. I could see a lot better from way up and I could see the thing's back or shoulders moving through the grass. I'd point it out to my dad, and then he'd throw more stones at it. It kept on coming back. To make matters creepier, we took a shortcut that was along the forest line on a thin dirt road. My dad started whistling loudly for my grandparents' German Shepherd boss. The house was still far away, but we could hear boss barking and moving towards us. Whatever that was following us was still following us. That dog was such a welcoming sight to see, sniffed around both of us for a moment, then dashed off into the field barking like mad. We got to my grandparents' house, my dad told my grandparents. I fell asleep on the couch. I talked to my dad about it many years later. He said after that they had smudged. My grandparents and father believe in the old ways and think maybe it was some bad medicine spirit and prayed for protection. Whatever it was, I was the target. Predators always go for the youngest or oldest. First of all, let me clarify that this is happening at my brother's house, not mine. The house has been around a little over a hundred years. My grandparents lived there for at least 50 years. My brother and his wife bought the house when they sold it. Every time I was over there as a kid, I felt like I was being watched. The upstairs was the worst. Especially the room next to the stairs, you just feel like you're not alone. Here's what they've told me. Pretty much every single night they hear footsteps all throughout the house. If they ask whatever it is to stop, it stops immediately. One day my sister-in-law, his wife, was home alone and heard my brother's voice coming from the baby monitor on the first floor. The other two monitors were on the second floor in my niece and nephew's bedrooms. It sounded exactly like him, but she called and made sure he was at work, not at the house. One night my nephew woke up around 3 a.m. to see what he described as a dark shape of a little boy looking into his bedroom. He said the boy started running down the hall to the room by the stairs, but when my nephew went in there he was gone. He drew a picture of this little boy but my nephew was six when it happened. He's eight now, so it was just a stick figure. The land itself used to be part of a property of a very old house up the road. I'm pretty sure they owned slaves back in the day. My first thought was maybe it's the ghost of a slave who was buried on the property, but that doesn't explain the voices right. Can ghosts mimic the living or is this something else? What do you guys think? So two of my friends snuck out last summer and took a walk listening to music. Decided to sit down on the road and talked a bit, and they both heard a distant scream that sounded pretty similar to an elk screech, but for like one second in duration. So they turned off the music and saw a huge humanoid horse looking things sprint out of this forest into a field. And they said it was running really fast, like 40 miles per hour. They said it was kind of hunched and had a limp was lean but muscular, and was completely pale or gray and naked. They both sprinted home and FaceTimed each other. When they got home and told me and a few others about it the next day, I was in disbelief so I snuck out on my bike the next night with my other friend and met up with the two original people along with some others and went looking for it. We heard the noises they described and me and my one friend saw a pale Bigfoot-looking creature walk in front of someone's barn light like 300 yards away, but we're not sure. We continue to do this for a few nights and one of them was walking to meet up with us alone to go looking for it and had seen it like five times on the walk there, sometimes like 20 feet in front of him. We probably all went looking for it like six or seven times in total. The last time we went looking, we all saw it 
and it was super tall, like eight, ten feet. Super fast, and had these glowing eyes you could see from a mile away. I'm pretty sure I also saw it have these long, greasy locks or strands of hair about shoulder length. Looked like a mix between a crawler, a Ren Jaeger titan form, and Jeff the Killer. It was creepy. And when it was on pavement, you could hear clopping noises like it had hooves or something. Aside from this, I was on a late-night gas station walk later that summer with two of my friends at three in the morning, and on our way back we saw something run or hobble across the road about 70 yards in front of us, and it looked pretty similar. However, it was much smaller, maybe five feet tall, but I could see it being maybe seven feet if it was standing fully upright. Does anybody have an idea of what this massive thing could be? This was in rural northeast Ohio. Edit. Was reading this over and forgot to add. We were walking on the way back to my friend's house one of the nights and behind somebody's house, we heard the noise of a baby crying in the woods. Couldn't have been mistaken for anything else but a baby. I did my undergrad at this tiny little college in the middle of a mountain range. Literally miles and miles of woods on every side. I think about 100 acres was technically the school's property, but except for the weird high security facility a few miles to the east, none of the neighbors cared if kids went hiking onto their property as long as they weren't destructive and wore bright colors during hunting season. Had a kid the year above me get a calf full of birdshot after running into their property with a turkey call. Anyways, the point is, there is or was a lot of woods and a lot of trail markers. My now ex, still very violent or nutty fiancé, was in a grad program in the city, so we were living apart. I was planning on going on a quick two-mile walk through the woods on a well-marked trail, just to see the lake, distress from midterms, etc. Relationship was extremely rocky at this point, and I get a phone call right before I start the trail. What it was about doesn't matter. The important part was that it was essentially a napalm bomb to the heart and my trust in humanity. Not trying to be dramatic, I was just a sensitive kid. So I took off sprinting down the trailhead, tears running down my face. Figured I'd take a slightly different trail that goes up a steep incline and maybe just burn myself out. It works, kind of. I'm catching my breath and still sobbing, and I hear a group of people on the trail headed towards me. Not wanting to be known as the crying girl in the woods and not entirely in my right mind, I took off running in a random direction, passing a lot of the tree houses and forts that people make in the woods, telling myself I know where I am and that I hike these woods often and can find my way back to either the trail entrance or to the road. I jumped two creeks, which in hindsight should have stopped me, because that meant I was straying way off campus. But I kept going, slipping on branches, and then picking a new direction to run in. I was a dumb kid. I was a really dumb kid. There were a couple turkey vultures following me which wasn't too surprising. Kids left food out pretty often so they tended to be watchful. On long hikes by myself I'd often sing to them when they tagged along. I started getting tired and slowed down to a walk, heading towards a small clearing with some toppled birch trees to sit on. My face was all messed up and my hair had little sticks and leaves in it, but I wasn't crying anymore. I lit a cigarette and stared at the ground and felt pretty damn sorry for myself. At some point I stopped feeling pretty damn sorry for myself and started feeling jumpy, kind of tingly, and everything I saw had this new level of sharpness and clarity to it. It wasn't really a feeling that I was being watched, more like I was somewhere I really, really didn't belong. It was starting to get dark, I had no cell service. The only thing I had on me besides my phone was a lighter, pack of cigarettes, and small pocket knife. Shorts, t-shirt, light windbreaker. I was literally search and rescue's worst nightmare. Trying to calm myself down, I tried to find any trail markers. None didn't recognize anything around me, couldn't hear any running water, and was too turned around to know where the road was. It was getting pretty chilly, and the woods were starting to make that sound that I can only describe as teeming. I didn't want to wander in a random direction, but the feeling of dread kept getting stronger and stronger, so I slowing started walking. 
started hearing things, mostly whispers, which I figured I was hallucinating due to dehydration or exhaustion. And then the shadows. It was the strangest thing, these tall, thin shadows being cast on the trees. I would have chalked it up to the sunset, but the movement of them was unnatural, and I kept catching them in the corner of my eye. They kind of swayed, or kind of jumped. It was a strange juxtaposition between how thoroughly creeped out I was and how pretty the sunset was that night. I remember looking at the sky, trying to calm myself down and pick a direction that felt right. But no direction felt right. I kept getting turned around, heard a few distinctive twig snaps in the distance. A wicked chill ran down my spine, and at this point I wasn't thinking eldritch forest elves, I was thinking bobcat or black bear. Started sniffling and crying silently again because I knew I had messed up. I was fifty shades of paranoid, dehydrated, and I pray to God hallucinating. And then I heard a rustle of wings that just about scared the shit out of me, and I looked up, and there was the vulture, just looking at me. I was so out of it that I think I asked it for help. It stared at me for a few more seconds, and then took off. It landed on a branch a few meters away and stared at me, doing the angry feather fluff thing that they do. Walked up to the tree it was perched in, and it took off again and landed on another branch a ways away. So I did what any sane person would do in that situation and followed the vulture. The feeling of dread slowly wore away and I started feeling okay. It was such a polite vulture, waiting for me to catch up and then flying off again. I don't remember how long I followed it, just that it was a while, and even when it was getting really twilight dusky out I still felt safe. I started recognizing landmarks glacial boulders, the tree forts, and could hear voices up ahead. The vulture lead me a few more meters, right onto the main trail, and then stayed put. I thanked it, apologized, and made my way towards the group of people camped out. I knew a bunch of the kids, they freaked out. I was promptly handed hot tea and french fries. They asked how the hell I made my way out there, and I just shrugged. I didn't feel like sharing about the vulture, and when I tried to spot him again, he'd flown off. Here's the real scary part of the story, though. No one realized I was gone. I lived alone, and my friends had assumed that I wasn't answering texts because I was studying. It was also a Friday, meaning that no one would have even thought it strange I was gone, as I often left to the city without telling anyone for the weekend. Essentially, no one would have even started looking until Monday, at which point I might have been either bobcat food or a sacrifice to the dear God. So thank you, my kind, kind vulture friend. Vultures are hands down my favorite animals now. I recently received a telephone call from a friend of an eyewitness who was born and raised in a northwest suburb of Chicago, Illinois. The only specific location reference was given as near the Des Plaines River. The eyewitness D discussed multiple sightings from 1978 through 1988 while he lived there as a boy. The sightings would usually occur at dusk and would continue throughout the night, and there were at least two winged creatures always seen flying in a wide circle at an altitude of 500-600 feet. The creatures were silhouetted against the clouds that were backlit by the city lights. The description of these creatures was that there was no head or neck that could be seen. They had long, thick tails, but no legs or feet were visible. The huge wings had no feathers, but were membraned, similar to that of a dragon or pterosaur. Apparently, the neighborhood residents were well aware of the nightly sightings. I solo sail a lot. I learned to sail when I was little, and have done three transatlantic cruises so far. This one time I was doing a transatlantic crossing from the Canaries to St. Lucia, it was late, and I was on deck doing an equipment check as per routine when sailing alone. So I am six days into the 14-day journey, and it's just nothingness all around. I mean, absolutely no light save for the stars and the moon. I can literally remember this like it was yesterday because I have never seen anything like it before. I was on deck and all of a sudden it was bright. Like midday, full sun bright. Mind you, it was near 2 a.m. at this point, so it made literally no sense. 
Immediately, I assumed it had to be a flare. Someone needed help. I came to a full stop, lowered the sails, and began radioing on all the emergency channels in Spanish and English. I did this for almost two hours, circling around and checking the radio. There was nothing. Around the second hour I gave up, I marked the location of my search pattern and kept going. I had no idea what it was, never saw anything like it again. The whole night lit up like the sun was out for a good three, four seconds. Unbelievable. Last year, my brother was driving through the dark roads of South Shore, Massachusetts, near the Bridgewater Triangle. It was dark, and there's limited street lights in the area. As he was driving, he noticed a cloaked figure standing on the tree line at the side of the road. He described it as wearing white robes and looking almost like a clansman, but without the pointy hat. As he drove by, the figure took notice and pivoted towards him very quickly, making direct eye contact. He became frightened enough that he sped away. I often wonder what he might have seen that night. Most of the town is very dense forest and the roads are unwalkable with no shoulders, so whatever it was likely came out of the woods. It unsettles me knowing the amount of acreage it came out of and whatever this person, if it was a person, was doing on the side of the road watching cars. In July 2018, I was staying in a very isolated region with limited access behind three log gates 20 miles south of Whitethorn, California on a primitive 4x4 road. This place is at the end of the road, a lost world of primeval forest on the northern border of a vast green belt spreading from Shelter Cove on the Lost Coast east to Highway 101 and south to Fort Bragg, California. At about 3 a.m. I was awakened. It was a hot, dark and completely silent July night in these mountains. Something above my tent location, approximately two to three hundred meters, began knocking on wood. It's best described as loud wax by a big club or branch on a tree trunk. They started one knock which got my attention. There was a brief hesitation then several more knocks, but randomly timed. The knocking was loud, so loud that it echoed down the canyon in the stillness. The event lasted only a minute or two. My first thoughts were that there was no one on the mountain who could be out here in the middle of a primitive and protective area. These knocks were from something large and no North American animal could have made them. Listening intently while my mind tried to wrap around how the noise was made, I began to wonder about Bigfoot legends. The night fell silent again. Afterward, I told a few locals and learned that there had been many Bigfoot sightings near Piercy and north of Willow Creek. Fast forward to two weeks ago, while waiting at the first locked gate to the same conservation area, I heard two distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained. As I waited in the dusk for about 45 minutes, waiting to meet a party at the gate who was running late, I heard a very loud wail, scream, or call that I'd never heard before in nature. The sound was coming from the heavily wooded area above me about two to three hundred meters. I instantly knew where I had heard such an unfamiliar call about three years previous. There's a few second delay from the first call, then a few more, then silence for about a minute leading me to wonder if this whole experience was surreal. It thought that it was an unknown animal or some kind of implausible prank. It was loud and echoing down the mountain as though some huge creature could belt with the lungs of Pavarotti, only much louder. The chance of it being a prankster in this wilderness was highly unlikely. Then began another call out at about three to four hundred meters to the north. It was also just as loud but came only three calls in succession. It had a distinct higher pitch. This absolutely blew my mind because the first call might be attributed to an elk on steroids, but the response brought chills down my spine. I'll never forget that second vocalization as it was so unique, and this was obviously communication between two individuals and possibly a rudimentary language. Another experience happened just the night before the dual vocalizations on a Friday evening in early November 2019. I had just moved into a cabin that my brother and I rented located along an extremely rugged canyon area of the Maddle River. It was dusk, quite dark already in the forest. 
I was outside looking at the stars, taking in the newness of these rugged surroundings. Suddenly, there was a screaming that was so loud and so foreboding that I could only listen in amazement. It was the loudest screaming I've ever heard. I thought it was produced by some kind of banshee from a horror film. The screaming continued at full throttle for over five minutes. I know mountain lions can scream, but nothing like this. It sounded much louder, more guttural, literally as if someone had set up loudspeakers and played the bloodiest scream that Hollywood could produce. I wondered if someone was up on the mountainside pranking me as a newcomer to the neighborhood. I listened for a bit then went inside and told my brother about it because it was so unnerving. Bigfoot did not ever enter my mind. But then at dusk, the very next evening, I heard two calls while waiting at the gate. I've since been over and over in my mind why have I been so lucky to hear and experience these mysterious sounds much less three distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained in a 24-hour period. I've been to a lot of different wilderness areas during my life, but those sounds in that specific location were simply remarkable. The Appalachian Trail stretches before me, a winding path that weaves through the breathtaking beauty of the dense woods. Towering trees stand tall, their branches reaching towards the sky, as if inviting me to explore their secrets. It's my first day as a park ranger, and the excitement bubbles within me like a rushing stream. My name is Ron, a nature enthusiast with a love for the wilderness, camping, and cats. As I embark on my journey along this renowned trail, I can't help but feel a mixture of awe and trepidation. Rumors of strange occurrences that have taken place here whisper through the air, adding an air of mystery to my new role. Eager to acquaint myself with the surroundings, I delve deeper into the trail, my senses heightened, absorbing every sound and shadow that dances around me. The forest comes alive with strange apparitions, fleeting glimpses of figures that seem to vanish as quickly as they appear. Eerie sounds echo through the trees, causing my heart to skip a beat. As I continue my patrol, my ears catch a distant sound that piques my curiosity. Intrigued, I follow the trail towards the source, my steps cautious but filled with a mix of fear and anticipation. The air grows heavy, and a chill runs down my spine as I come face to face with a creature beyond my wildest imagination. Before me stands a dogman, a beast with the body of a bipedal wolf and a face that resembles that of a human. Its eyes meet mine, a gaze filled with primal intelligence and hunger. I fumble for my mobile, desperate to capture evidence of this unearthly encounter, but my hands tremble, and the phone slips from my grasp, crashing to the ground. The dogman, alerted by the sound, charges towards me with a fury I could not have fathomed. Instinct kicks in, and I draw upon my training, grappling with the beast in a desperate struggle for survival. Adrenaline surges through my veins as I manage to grab hold of a knife, slashing at the creature's throat. It collapses to the ground, lifeless. Breathing heavily, disbelief courses through my veins as I stare at the fallen dogman. This extraordinary creature, the stuff of legends, now lies motionless at my feet. Fumbling to retrieve my broken phone, I attempt to capture proof of this extraordinary encounter, only to find it useless, shattered beyond repair. Doubt gnaws at the edges of my mind as I return to the trail, my footsteps heavy with the weight of what I've witnessed. Determined to seek assistance and share my unbelievable tale, I make my way back to the park ranger station to inform my senior colleague. Together, we return to the spot where the dogman had fallen, only to find an empty clearing. I honestly don't know how to explain what had happened to me. I believe I saw some sort of Native American entity. I was working as a ranger for the city of Austin, Texas. I just had one left of our reserve campsites when a very strange thing occurred. This was about 10.30 at night. I was driving my four-wheel drive pickup truck on a dirt road that led back to the entrance of the park. The area is a wooded hillside spanning 200 acres and contains a very large number of wildlife. So, being nighttime and how many animals are nocturnal, 
I was watching out for signs of their movement on either side of me. It was quiet, and I was the only one around. I had been following the road closely when I got this strong sensation, the road, everything around it, dense woods. I looked up just as a deer ran out in front of my truck directly in my path. It was something like 40 yards ahead of me when I saw it. I reacted immediately by pulling onto the shoulder, slamming my brakes. The deer now was only about 10 feet away from my truck when I swerved, and it vanished as soon as it went out of sight. The feeling that it told me to look up subsided. Everything went back to normal. There were no other cars on the road, of course, being just mine. I sat in place, trying to collect my bearings. My heart was beating fast, and I had a headache, and I couldn't explain these feelings. What on earth? So something brought my attention to the hillside, right where the deer had come from, and that's when I saw movement about 50 yards into the brush. It wasn't clear. I got out of my truck to inspect and walked up to the spot where I thought I had seen the movement through the tree line. The woods were pretty thick, but about 20 feet into them, there was a small opening in trees with lower branches and ones that were not as wide or tall. They almost kind of formed a natural corridor that maybe, I'd say 50 yards opened up to the hillside before becoming obscured by the other trees and foliage. The ground sloped slightly upward many leaves. I called out with my flashlight, thinking, why would there be somebody out here? It didn't make any sense. Thinking maybe I was just seeing things or it might be another deer. There was no answer, and that was it. I assumed it was just my own paranoia. Now I didn't hear anything move past me, so I decided to inspect further because why not? Calling out loudly I knew, at least, I'm pretty sure I saw a movement. And again, there should be no reason at all why anybody should be this far out here late at night. The movement I saw was more like a person, not a deer, at least I'm sure of it. So I kind of very shortly walked up the hillside, never hearing a sound. I decided finally that okay, enough is enough. I'm gonna leave and head back to my truck. As soon as I got in, I realized there was something wrong, something strange and paranormal if you will. As soon as I got back in my truck, that's when I saw it coming out of the woods ahead of me, slightly up from where the deer emerged. It is what I can only unmistakably describe as an apparition. It was this glowing, translucent being, but unmistakably a spirit. It shimmered, seeming to be faint, but nearly transparent. It came closer to my truck and appeared as if it were getting bigger, but also darker and more solid at the same time. It was this light grayish color, and then would grow darker in color, kind of pulsating. It just walked right past the front of my truck with no fear or concern about my presence whatsoever. It just walked by like nothing was there, with some kind of purposeful stride, without having so much as even a look of curiosity. And then, right there in my view, it just vanished, fading into obscurity. Not wasting a second, I flew my vehicle out of there, and my only mission in that moment was to go, 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 go. Before this, I thought ghosts were a joke. I had never been a believer in the paranormal or what many refer to as the spirit realm. But after this, that changed my mind, and I'll never forget what I saw. But it wasn't until the following morning when I really kind of fully mentally processed what I saw, surprisingly because I didn't sleep that much. But a thought occurred to me, and I realized what it really happened. What I saw looked like a stereotypical image of a native, long hair down to its shoulders, feathers, a headdress, actually. My professional theory is that somebody, a Native American, has gone through this road many times before in their lifetime, and they're simply showing me something that happened here at some point along the way. Maybe they stumbled upon these woods at night, and for whatever reason, they were killed on the spot by first contact European settlers, who probably had no qualms about killing anybody different than them, including women and children. I do not believe this entity or spirit to have been malicious. It didn't come off as that. It was just something that happened to them in their lifetime. This spirit was merely doing whatever some non-physical thing does when in the process of trying to relive what happened. It's a possibility that this spot is where these people might have been killed or injured in an altercation. Maybe they were stuck between this world and the next. I don't know. 
Maybe they've seen my truck hundreds of times out here late at night over the years, and now I'm able to pick up on whatever happens to come through here. Who knows? Anyway, that's my experience with the paranormal. Hopefully, it will be my last. I have family in law enforcement, and I found these old archive files. Well, my grandfather did because he has access to documents. This is an old printout of something that I found very interesting, so I thought I would share it with you. Here you go. May 22, 1984, Officer LG was patrolling the area around a local park during the night shift. At approximately 1.25 a.m., the officer reported veering off course to investigate flashing lights in an adjacent wooded section of the city. Spotting several bright lights slowly hovering along the tree line, as he drove closer to investigate, his vehicle reportedly lost power and stalled. As he approached, an object described as having a dark body with many bright lights hovered silently above him, roughly 300 feet away. The object allegedly reeled out some type of thin black cord, which struck and wrapped around his police car as it backed away from him. The object then took off into the air and disappeared into darkness. Officer LG wrote his account of the event on May 24, 1984. The following day, he reported the incident to command, who denied anything had happened and insisted that his vehicle was in perfect working order. Officer LG's police cruiser was inspected by technicians at the city garage, who found nothing wrong with it mechanically. No evidence of alterations or unusual damage were noted after inspection. No support for Officer LG's claim would come from local authorities until three months later when another officer, Officer F, called into dispatch, reporting a very similar object near the same park, along with reports of several other officers who had also spotted strange lights descending toward a tree line, then vanishing without explanation. Thereafter, Officer F and Officer LG were reportedly ridiculed by command to stop spreading rumors ultimately leading to Officer LG being permanently dismissed from duty. I was recently working near a river in the British Columbia wilderness, when about 20 meters from me and my co-worker we heard loud footsteps crashing through the trees. My co-worker yelled out. Nothing, the footsteps continued, but after he yelled out a second time the footsteps stopped and then things went completely silent. There was other people in the vicinity throughout the week, but to our knowledge, nobody there that day. I grew up hunting and I am very familiar with the fauna of Western Canada. It sounded like a bull or cow moose or elk, perhaps a sizable buck. But to my knowledge, they don't have the smarts to actively hide from humans when they are yelled at. Same with bears. Mountain lions, however, do but I don't believe one would ever be so loud and clumsy sounding. WTF was in the woods. I'm not above thinking it was perhaps a Bigfoot. Or was it a sinister person? In 2014, I was living with my then girlfriend, now wife and our son in a forest house close to the center of Bolton and Northwest England. The house is what we call a two-up, two-down here because they have two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs. The stairs ran down the kitchen side of the wall that divided the two downstairs rooms. My girlfriend was working on a course to become a veterinary nurse. For this, she had to work the 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. shifts. So there was just me and my son in the house. I had put him to bed a few hours before and was now downstairs washing the pot and pans. I heard footsteps on the landing and assumed it was my son, thinking he had woken up and was now running around upstairs looking for us, as he was apt to do. I dried my hands and prepared to go through the routine of putting him back to bed, but I noticed these were not the erratic footsteps of a child, but the heavy deliberate footsteps of an adult. The footsteps began to descend the stairs. I turned to see not my son, but a tall woman dressed in a long white gown. As her head came into view, I could see she was well over six feet tall and had long blonde hair. The stairs curved to the left as they approached the ground. As this woman rounded the corner, I saw her face. She looked odd. 
Her features were human, but something was off about them, like she was something imitating a human. As she took the last step towards the floor, she vanished. I stood still in shock for a few moments, but then plucked up the courage to go upstairs and check on my son. Thankfully, he was still fast asleep. About half an hour later, my girlfriend got home. I was still slightly shaken up, but happy to see another real human. She wasn't all that surprised, which was a bit unnerving. She had lived there for a few years before I met her and most people who visited experienced something in that house. Mostly knocks and bangs at all hours and ghost cats. The bangs could have been the neighbors to be fair. Having to tell people the cat they just saw run through the house isn't your cat is always a fun conversation. Thankfully, the full-body apparitions weren't all that common. So my friend told me this story and swears it's true. It still sends chills down my spine every time I think about it. So it's a story of his friend, who's also a skilled hunter named Joe, a man who played guitar in local indie band, and an experienced tracker. One fateful day, Joe embarked on a solo expedition deep into the wilderness of New Mexico, unaware of that that awaited him. It started out like any other hunting trip, the crisp air of the wilderness was there as he ventured into the heart of nature, his rifle by his side and a sense of anticipation in his veins. He had his sights set on an elk, a creature whose meat would sustain him through the coming months. As the sun began its descent, casting long shadows across the landscape, he finally spotted the perfect target. With steady hands and focused determination, he aimed and fired the sound of the gunshot shattering the tranquil silence of the forest. The elk fell, and he felt a mix of pride and relief. But then, things started to go awry. As he approached the fallen elk, a strange sensation washed over him. It was as if a pair of eyes were piercing through the dense foliage, watching his every move. He brushed it off as mere paranoia, attributing it to the isolation of the wilderness. Yet, as he reached down to claim his prize, a roar echoed through the trees, shaking him to the core. He froze, his heart pounding in his chest, as he turned to face the source of the terrifying sound. What he saw defied all logic and reason. Standing before him was a massive bipedal creature, towering over like a Bigfoot. Before he could react, the creature lunged at him with lightning speed, its powerful fist connecting with his jaw. He crumpled to the ground, disoriented and in pain, as it swiftly grabbed the elk carcass, tearing it away from his grasp. The creature vanished into the wilderness, leaving him in a state of shock and disbelief. So he sat there, trying to make sense of what had just happened. He says it felt like a nightmare, but the ache in he jaw and the lingering taste of blood confirmed its chilling reality. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't shake off the image of that immense creature stealing his kill. He still swears it's a true story. Do with this story what you want. Ex-Royal Navy Lieutenant here. Back in 26, the ship I was on H.S. York was crossing the Bay of Biscay when we found a single empty survival suit floating around. When it was first spotted, we thought it was a body, but when we put a boat out to check it out, it turned out to be empty probably fell off a container ship in a storm or something totally normal. Or maybe something else spooky or whatever. That was kind of creepy, but not really. We bend it almost immediately. Of course, there's nothing your average sailor likes more than gossip and exaggeration. So within a matter of hours, there were rumors sweeping the lower decks that the guys who'd picked it up out of the water had found blood, or body parts, or bike marks, or anything else someone could make up. Classic sailor rumor monitoring action. A few days later, I had one of the younger and more gullible lads 17 or 18 years old in my division ask to speak to me in private and tell me that he was scared that he'd get eaten by a sea monster if he went overboard. Naturally, I told him we'd do our best to get him out of the water before any of the local wildlife could get a proper hold on him. Job's a good un. Around about 20 years ago, I worked for the Big Boy Scout Ranch in New Mexico. 
Philmont. Google it. It's gorgeous. The ranch itself is divided up into little regional support zones. You have a base camp where all these backpacking hiker scouts would come in. Ages of about 14, 21 sometimes with their parents, but generally chaperoned in some way, and oftentimes a mix of guys and girls. So these kids, and I use the word kid loosely, because hey, I'm old, and all you 20-somethings are kids to me. It's not an insult, it's just perspective. Would go through an initial training period, and then be set loose on the ranch. They'd get an itinerary, telling them to be at X place at Y time, and then off they'd go. Knocking out their 100 plus mile course over 10 days to three weeks. I have to admit it was pretty awesome as a scout. It was a grand experience, and at $350 a kid for two weeks, it was pretty cheap. So anyway, regional zones of control. Scattered throughout the ranch, there were maybe 100-120 primitive camping sites. Some place to drop your gear, get water, take a dump, whatever. You might be on the trail for two, three days before you got to one of the 34-36 staffed backcountry camps. A backcountry camp had a staff of 3-6 depending on the size and activity. The activity was some sort of Old West style skill that they would then teach the kids. Maybe it's gold panning or deep rock mining, shotguns, burrow racing, compass and starlight navigation, whatever. I worked at three separate backcountry camps during my years as staff. This would have been the summer of 90s. There were a number of bear attacks that year, more than a dozen. There were also two mountain lion attacks that thankfully the news agencies ignored. Come to think of it, I was stalked twice, each time for more than 30 minutes. I worked at Harlan Camp, a backcountry camp with guns, specifically shotguns. Full NR a certified range, and donation of four gorgeous Ruger Red Label over under 12 gauge shotguns. We'd spend the mornings teaching kids to reload birdshot shells, and spend the afternoons blazing away at clay pigeons. We also had burrows. Think of them as shorter, more pissed off donkeys. We'd name them, and then just after dinner the kids would be assigned a burrow, and flog them up and down the valley in a race and we'd watch every time and pray that the kids wouldn't get their face kicked in. But when we weren't teaching the kids, we maintained an active search area of about 24 square miles around our little backcountry heaven. We were all search and rescue trained. Occasionally, a half crew of bewildered campers would hit our front porch and tell us that someone had fallen and broken a leg or needed to be similarly evacuated. So this is really just one story of many. Our camp also bordered the highway, and we often had weirdos try and hike up the jeep trail from the road. We'd have to corral these people and escort them off the ranch. Once at gunpoint. Spooky tale starts here. So it's just after midnight. Late part of the season, maybe the first or second weekend of September. Weather starting to change, the nights came earlier. The camp had finally quieted down, and we'd wrapped up the last bear patrol of the evening. Basically running around and making sure some dumbass kid hadn't dumped powdered Gatorade on a stump again in the hopes of luring a bear to his campsite. The bulk of the campers were asleep by about 9 p.m.-ish. On these nights, there was one lone light on the staff cabin. Really just bright enough for you to find your way to the shitter and back without getting lost. No moon this night but the starlight could still be pretty incredible. Were it not so overcast, we're sitting there on the front porch. Three of us. The camp director is inside. We're cleaning the guns. I can still remember the smell of the solvent. Big black glass bottle. We'd just slid the guns back into the safe, and we were locking up when it started. Screaming. Sounded like a person. Sounded like several. Women. Screaming. I've never heard anything like it before or since, but distant, and close all at the same time. I looked at my buddy, and we both grabbed our guns and reached for the emergency loads. One shell of tightly packed power that made one hell of a noise, and one shell loaded with zeros and buckshot that we didn't let the kids use. We booked it out to the burrow pens, only to find the burrows not there. They had a square enclosure and a sort of long run, that opened up to a small fence pasture and a hayloft about 20 feet tall. 
so we make it through the gate, and the screaming is much worse. Maybe two minutes have passed since we stepped off the cabin porch. I'm in the best shape of my life at this point, but still my heart was pounding so hard I could hear it. I could feel the blood pumping in my ears I was so on edge. We moved back into the enclosure spread out so as not to accidentally blow each other in half. The screaming changed, shifted from high pitch to something more guttural, more like a low, hoarse, raspy growl. Sounded huge moving through the tree lines just outside the fence. We finally get to the burrows. They're all bunched up by the fence line. They see us and come running over, like we're part of the herd or something. They're shaking, and in the cool, crisp air, they're sweating, like they've been sprinting back and forth in the pen. The screaming stops, the whatever the F it was moves back into the tree. My buddy takes aim and fires his noise load, but this did not hasten the withdrawal of the creature. We packed the noise loads two months previous in celebration of the 4th of July. We'd hiked up to the ridge, and at midnight, our guns had belted fire into the sky. The thunderous rapport was reported heard from the other camps up the valley, 20 miles away. Fitting since it took two days for my ears to stop ringing. The creature took its time leaving. Huge bushes shook when it made its way through them. We hung around with the burrows till dawn. Took turns sleeping in the hayloft just in case. The burrows. Best to think of them like big dogs seemed overjoyed to have us there. Leaping and jumping about. When the sun came up, I saw the blood. Blood on the hooves of the burrows. Blood in the pasture. Blood on the fence, blood splattered on hay. Blood on our boots and jeans where we'd failed to see what we were standing in the night before. I followed the blood trail up the ravine wall that the fence pasture backed up to. I didn't have to go more than 20 or 30 years before I found what was left of it. Big mountain lion, probably male, I couldn't tell, got into the burrow pen, probably thinking he could take one down. Goddamned burrows stomped the F to death. Its rear legs were practically sheared off, crushed pelvis and lower spine twisted and exposed. It didn't react to the noise from the shotgun because it couldn't. It just wanted to get away from there before it died. My grandfather was on the USS Block Island when it was sunk off the coast of Italy in 1944. Six men lost, and 951 were rescued by the other ships in the fleet. When the ship was hit, obviously the evacuation was immediate. No time to grab personal effects, just grab a life vest and get the F out. Eventually my grandfather was plucked out of the water by a marine on another vessel. Fast forward to 1966. My grandfather was working in a hangar in the Norfolk, Virginia Naval Base. Right as he was getting ready to wrap up his work for the day, he was approached by two men in suits. They were FBI. FBI, are you ex? Grandpa, yes. FBI, were you on the USS Block Island in 1944? Yes. Were you issued a 9 mm pistol, serial 12,345,678? I believe so. Minutes. Do you know where that pistol is right now? At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, as far as I know. Turns out that as the ship was being evacuated and someone grabbed some weapons, or at least this particular one out of the armory, the weapon somehow found its way to the U.S. and had been found at the scene of a mob murder the two weeks earlier in New York City. Edit. Now that I am thinking about it, their rescue was pretty badass too and worth telling. The other ships in the fleet sailed full speed towards the floating survivors. Then cut their engines to avoid detection from the U-boat's radar, I guess. And their momentum allowed them to drift through the survivors and pick them up. My grandfather said he tread water for hours before finally being scooped out of the ocean. Most of the guys had life vests, but they only helped keep them afloat for a little while, and they had to share them. He said he didn't have enough strength to pull himself up onto the rescuing vessel, and that the marine that pulled him out of the water was one of the largest men he had ever seen in his life. As the block island sank, the survivors heard an explosion. 
They were pretty sure it was the sound of the block island exploding either as a result of the water pressure on the munitions, or maybe something in the ship was still burning and caught munitions, or the ship's fuel supply. No matter the case, they were pretty sure the sound came from their sinking ship, because of the direction it came from. The German sub that hit them thought the explosion was the sound of them being hit and surfaced to assess the damage. When the Germans surfaced, the rest of the fleet blew the U-boat out of the water. I was RV camping with my Irish wolfhound, Marty, last summer. We were in an old camping ground outside of Naples, Florida. Marty wanted out around 10 p.m. that night. Not long after I let him out, I heard a loud yelping from the swamp. I immediately flooded the area with my handheld spotlight, calling out to Marty. That's when I saw an unusual creature with eyes that glowed brilliant orange. The creature was yellowish brown, two half feet tall bipedal with several foot long spines on the back. It was hunched over Marty, sucking blood out of, of his neck. It screeched at me and ran off. Marty's neck had two fang marks as he laid lifeless. I heard another scream nearby so I picked up Marty's body and headed home to the 24-hour vet. The vet said he had never seen this before and confirmed that Marty had been drained of blood. He mentioned El Chupacabras from his home in Puerto Rico, but said he had never seen one and thought his was a myth. So I'm not a skeptic or anything. I just haven't dealt with much paranormal-related stuff because I steered clear of anything that could potentially haunt me. So no dolls, mirrors, paintings, etc. About a year ago, when I was staying up late sometimes, I would hear this extremely loud breathing, or at least some sort of airy movement that went on for 30 seconds whilst I just listened. It sounded the same and just as clear even if I was in different locations for each separate occurrence. Once in the bedroom, once in the living room, and once in the home office. On the second floor, it happened in several month intervals, and it sounded consistent or mechanical, perhaps. Enough that I figured there must be some sort of normal explanation. The house is very new, to many tennis, no basement, no dark past or anything. What could explain that? Thank you. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.